up the debt. Because if they did that, it would have crushed down the values in the market even more so. So basically, the TARP money from the government, from you as a taxpayer, was directed to the financial institutions to recapitalize them. They first, of course, tried to recapitalize them in the market. It didn't go very far be before the buyers became very thin in understanding that basically they had so many losses that, they, that, had, they had, that, that were cascading on the bank that they were unwilling to put any capital in. So it became a government, or excuse me, a taxpayer recapitalization of the financial institutions. Then the question is, um, what else did the government do? So they had, an asset, they had an asset plan, but what else did they do? Well, they had something else that they did, and that is uh, they tried to generate income. We had an income problem and an asset problem. The income problem they tried to attack by <clears throat> um, first giving us a rebate on our taxes, basically send the cash back. It turns out it didn't work. It was supposedly $300 per person, and when the, cat, when, the, when the money was refunded to us, I guess it was a year ago, April, approximately 90% of it was used to pay off debt. Because you have a consumer who's upside down, their bigger interest in rather than spending the money is to retire the debt. So basically it pushed our savings rate up enormously, but the, but the government basically, uh, I forgot the, the total bill, it was supposedly $300 per taxpayer. Um, but whatever it was, it was uh, financed in the market, checks were cut, sent to us personally, and basically it went back into paying off debt. Uh, what that means is we as a nation very systematically now, and that was the first major instance of it, but it's continuing to happen, is that this additional government income flow generation that they're trying to provide, which is paid dollar for dollar with more debt, is turning around and generating maybe 10, 20 cents of income. Uh, because we're saving all the rest. So basically, the consumer is upside down and they are attempting to deleverage. And what that means is for every dollar of government debt that we incur to maintain income, it doesn't go to spending and generate more income. Rather, it goes to deleveraging. Now, what that means for us as a nation, and this is where we get into the problems that we'll discuss next time, is that we're, we're generating a dollar of debt and, and basically the number is, and I'll show you, the number is we're ge out of a dollar of debt we're generating, we're only getting about 18 cents of spending. So we can't get our head above water on the spending issue. Can we get our head above water on the asset value, the upside downness? Well, as I say, the government did, you know, they borrowed 700 billion, they knew it wasn't enough, so they put the money into recapitalizing financial institutions. The other way to do it is to call the Fed in, and the Fed, of course, got called in mightily, shall we say. Um, and what the Fed did was um, they expanded their balance sheet. It was a year ago, November. Um, they were at a balance sheet level of about $900 billion and almost overnight expanded it by 144%. Uh, basically, I did the calculation. Basically, they gave us a 50-year infusion of new money. That would be the normal rate over 50 years, and they did it in a month. And basically what they're doing is running their balance sheet and, and paying for it with, with, with currency, and they're buying assets. And they did it to the tune of $1.3 trillion. And think about the number $1.3 trillion. It's, it's about almost 10% of GDP. So basically it, it should provide a lot of support because there's, there's a lot of purchasing power. It's 10% of GDP. But it wasn't enough. In fact, they're supposed to get more out of it. If they spend $1.3 trillion, if you, um, and since I'm speaking to a McCombs audience, I presume most of you took a money banking course at some point in your career. And if you remember, if, if there's a monetary expansion by the central bank, in turn, that gives something called liquidity reserves to commercial banks. And the commercial bank can take every dollar of liquidity reserve and ramp it up roughly 10 times. So when the Fed expands by a dollar, you generally get 11 or $12 of new credit, in other words, new purchasing power in the asset markets to, to bolster those assets so that the institutions are no, no longer under, uh, underwater. Well, the amazing thing that happened, well, a few things, there's so many things that happened were amazing. Number one, the Fed for the first time, instead of printing the, running the printing press and buying treasuries, they bought all kinds of private assets. And at first they were supporting the debt of other financial institutions 
because this is short-term debt, and whoever loaned those other institutions the money realized their assets were less than the debt, so none of these people rolled over the debt, in which case these other financial institutions would have to sell assets to pay off debt. So the, we, we want to contain the selling, and this I'm talking about the Lehman weekend and the Bear Stearns weekends of, of, of 08. So basically what the Fed uh, did was uh, gave the ammunition to the commercial banks to take their 1.3 trillion and ramp it up an additional 13 trillion. Now think of the number 13 trillion. Right now our total spending in the U.S. is 14 trillion a year. So that would be a huge ramp up. It turns out that, guess what happened? <laughs> now we know, and the numbers are out. It turns out that the Fed uh, bought private assets, they paid for it with currency, the currency goes on to the asset side of the bank balance sheet from which they could ramp it up and meet their currency requirement relative to deposits. They could ramp it up 10, ten times. Well, the numbers are now out this week. Uh, the ramp up was negative. Um, actually, the commercial banks in, in 2009 actually contracted. And here's the graph right here. And this was only all of last week. The numbers for 209 came out. Uh, this is in your packet. It's, um, it's an article called, oh, and I love the, the terminology of lending falls at an epic pace. This, in the Wall Street Journal, this, it's about halfway through your, your packet. Lending falls at epic pace. More than 5% of all loans were at least three months past due. There was a, not, only, not only were things past due, but this is the lending balance. This is the balance of loans on the books of the commercial banking system, which is basically the size of their balance sheet. Well, in 2009, it, they contracted. They went below zero, and the contraction was, was enormous. And not only was it enormous, but take a look at how frequently this kind of event happens. Well, it happened in 1942, for reasons I don't understand, at the beginning of World War II. I'm not sure what happened then. But in 1990, we had a similar uh, commercial bank uh, crisis where we had uh, a lot of commercial banks uh, that had a lot of bad loans. They were also upside down. The bad loans they had in that episode was South America sovereign debt. Um, and basically, uh, they were underwater. They, they shrunk in capital. As you shrink in capital, you have to also shrink the bank as well, even if you have the liquidity. So basically, in the last 70 years, we've only had, what, basically three events where the commercial banking system shrunk. But this is in the face of the central bank providing them with liquidity, like a 50-year increase in their liquidity, <laughs> um, which is absolutely startling. So basically, what's going on? Well, this, this has to tell you a pretty clear picture. These banks are so underwater that, uh, in fact, what happened with the banking system, um, and actually I kind of drew this in in a very free, free form. The commercial banks uh, at the end of 2008, I don't know what the footing exactly was. I think it was about $13 trillion. And uh, they did show about 10% capital on the books, depending on how the accountant, uh, th this is about 13 trillion. We're now down to about 12 trillion in assets. But what was interesting is the deposit shrunk more than the assets shrunk. So on the books, the capital actually increased of a shrunken bank. And the question is, uh, uh, how is that possible <laughs> uh, when we have so many bad loans? Well, it turns out that uh, in, in 2008, how one evaluated bank assets was a market test applied, and the accountant took the market value and used that as the assets of the bank. But Congress, realizing that if we used market value, put pressure on the accounting industry to suspend market value accounting and go back to uh, original cost, less some write-off when it is uh, delinquent. So basically, Congress... Uh, started the cover-up <laughs> that allowed the accountants uh, to not be exposed to lawsuits. Uh, and allow, it's, it's Enron. This is Enron all over again. Um, this time, it's, the, the plot is not hatched uh, uh, by skilling, but it's, it's hatched by the FDIC. Um, basically, we have cover-up accounting. And so what we have is assets 
that exceed liabilities. So the, the balance sheet has shrunk, and actually capital on the book has increased, on the books have increased, which is really fictitious because uh, it really does not make any allowance for what are the real, realistic losses that are coming forth. The system of accounting now that would cause them to write their assets down and to write their capital down is going to be the test of whether or not uh, the, the loan continues to be serviced, uh, principal and interest, and whether or not the, uh, the bank decides to take the keys, uh, take the collateral, sell the collateral, and write the loan down. By the way, in the residential mortgage-backed security, in the residential real estate area, we're actually getting loan modifications that are beginning now with some, some banks that have been successful in raising capital. They now have the ability, they have the excess capital to take some write-downs, and so I think that's going to start to accelerate in the next year or two. So basically, w what happened in terms of bailing us out at the government level of the Fed trying to add value, um, we didn't add value through adding purchases and having the market ramp the value up. Instead, we used accounting trickery. <laughs> and we have this in incredible situation where the banks actually shrunk despite this massive increase in liquidity. Now, the massive increase in liquidity still had an impact. And the impact it had of this story is that it scared an awful lot of McCombs graduates uh, who over the years took money in banking and were told that when the Fed doubles the money supply, expect the price level to double, a la Mar uh, Milton Friedman. Um, and so what was created by the Fed enormous expansion was inflation expectations. And the inflation expectations caused Americans to fear a ramping up of the Fed expansion with a commercial bank expansion, and they feared, and I wish, I wish their, their fears came true, <laughs> that we would have so much spending it would create inflation. Um, so they started to bail out of the dollar. They started to bail out of fixed income. Fixed income prices fell. Market yields rose, which is exactly the opposite of what the Fed tried to create uh, to try to get us out of, of, of a recession. The, um, and what then happened, if you remember last summer, it forced Bernanke to go public uh, with a 60-minute interview where he said to try to calm the fears, of the, the inflation fears that the Fed generated by this expansion of the monetary base. And he basically said, we're going to have an exit strategy. Well, that's what he said last, uh, I think it was April or May or June. And, and the week after he got re uh, was confirmed uh, by the Senate, uh, he uh, unleashed his exit strategy as promised. And the whole thing was, and, and, and if you look at it as an analyst, you're saying, oh my gosh, the Fed is, is exiting and the problem is not over yet. Well, it turns out what the Fed did was fake it. What they really did, um, actually, they, they expanded the monetary base. <laughs> they just told everyone we're going to exit. And what they did of substance, and they did do something of substance, and what they did of substance is... They, they refinanced the liability side of their balance sheet. In fact, they did it last week. Um, what they did as far as Federal Reserve, their assets and liabilities, as they buy assets, they pay for them with dollars. That's how they, they do it. The, the dollars go to the commercial banks. And those dollars sitting as assets at the commercial bank gives them the power to ramp up some very large multiple. So basically, what they were trying to do is engineer exit by not actually shrinking the balance sheet because that requires the sale of assets. And the sale of assets pushes prices down and interest rates up. So, but instead, what they did was they had such a large excess, the commercial banks had such a large excess of dollars that they met the liquidity requirement two to one huge excess, uh, excess reserves. They didn't need all those, that excess reserve. In fact, it was just a fright factor. So the Fed wanted to, what's the word, theoretically constrain the commercial banks who by themselves were shrinking. And the way they did this is they substituted on the liability side of their balance sheet, not dollars, but they sold debt. Um, and, and they sold debt to three parties. For one, they're gonna sell debt to banks. And these are term deposits. Uh, I'm not sure what the maturity is, but it's not a, resi it's not a, it's not a member bank deposit. It's a term deposit, which does not count for, for the, the uh, re reserve requirement. They're going to sell debt to banks. They just sold two.